Well, I mean, uh, until, until October, it was something that, um, you know, very great people. <laughs> and I, I, in my imagination, uh, you know, I, I always thought, you know, uh, older people <laughs> won. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything I, I would win. But I mean, but I, um, I'm going to say this um, uh, when I deliver my banquet speech later. But I first heard about the Nobel Prize when I was a small child in Japan. Um, and my mother, I remember still, my mother ex ex explaining it to me, and, and, and I'm looking at a, uh, it must have been some sort of educational book, uh, telling, telling, telling the readers about the history of the Nobel Prize. So for me, it's, it's, it's been in, embedded in my imagination, you know, all through my life, as, this, as, as probably, yes, the, the greatest prize that a person can win in the world. Well, I, I think it's better not to be um, too self-conscious about being a role model. You know, um, I've been, uh, you know, it's, it's ever since I became a kind of published writer and became well known, I, I think, I think you, you have that sense anyway, that you have to be, um, you have to be, you know, responsible to some extent, but also but to, to, to try and inspire younger, younger people and so on, um, and, and your you know, fellow writers. And, um, the Nobel, becoming a Nobel laureate has, has, has made me more conscious of this role. I, th I think this is a, uh, it's put me on a different um, level in terms of being a role model, or my responsibility as a public figure. So that's something I'm going to have to think about and get get used to. I'm no longer just um, a writer, you know, um, of interest to people who, who are interested in writers. I, I've, I'm occupying some other special position as a Nobel laureate. So it's something I haven't quite worked out yet. But I think I have to be very careful because I noticed already in the two months since the announcement, I've been asked to do all kinds of things, um, you know, sign petitions, support all kinds of campaigns, um, take part in discussion programs I have no qualification to, d to take part in. Uh, many invitations have come in that I wouldn't have received before October. And I think um, I've had this advice from past Nobel Prize winners I've met um, to be careful. Um, you know, don't, I mustn't put myself on a platform uh, for which I'm not qualified. Uh, and so I think that's a very important piece of advice, not just for me, but for the, for the world. You know, we don't want... We don't want um, people who are not experts um, talking as though they are. This is one of the problems in the world today. So, so that's something I'm going to be uh, um, quite disciplined about. I'm, I'm only going to talk about things I know about. Well, the, the importance of any prize, I mean, there, there are many prizes in the world, you know. And so the, so the importance of any prize, how seriously we take the prize, for me, I think it, you know, it depends on the, the integrity of the people who give the prize and also on the, on the history of past winners. I think those are the two important things because prizes themselves are, are used as a tool all around the world now um, to promote things, most, most often to, to promote a company or to promote something, but sometimes they are used um, to promote political ideas. Um, uh, and sometimes quite subtly and sometimes le le less so. So, um, uh, you know, uh, there have been prizes that I've turned down because I, I thought, um, you know, I, I, they weren't hideously bad prizes, but I, I thought I, I don't necessarily wish to be helping to promote something. And so, so I think um, we have to be aware that prizes are, are a technique. Uh, you know, um, they're, they're sometimes, uh, they are sometimes propaganda. They're sometimes promotional tools for organizations, corporations, institutions. And so I always ask myself this question about any prize, whether somebody else is getting it or whether I'm being offered it. You know, um, uh, it, it, who, who is giving it? Do I respect the values that lie behind the prize and the people who are giving it? 
and do I respect the, the previous uh, winners? And, um, and I think that this is the first thing I said quite spontaneously when I received the call from the Swedish Academy. I, I said, uh, you know, I, I feel emotionally, you know, truly honoured about the Nobel because I can absolutely honestly say that the, the Nobel is an institution that, that I deeply respect and I deeply, deeply respect the past winners in literature that have received it you know, since 1901. I mean, a lot of my greatest heroes are, are there on that list. Um, but, so the Nobel, I think, is, is a prize that has managed to capture the imagination of the world, um, not as a promotional tool, but as something that exemplifies an ideal about humanity and, and what we strive for. Uh, and that's, that's quite a rare thing. You know. um, I think there are many great prizes, but I think the Nobel sets a very high standard because it's not just about the, um, it's not just about the specialist area that, that we, we may or may not excel in. It's, there is a higher ideal, I think, about, um, about peace, cooperation between people, the striving, striving of human beings to, to improve our civilization. And I think, I think these are very, very high ideals. I think, um, I think earlier in my career, um, I was always very interested in, um, in looking at individuals who struggled with their past and their memories. So, so I, typically I would look at a character um, in late middle age or old age, someone who'd been quite proud of himself or herself, um, but then quite late in life, gains a perspective um, about, about his life, let's just say his life, you know, um, and, and, and he starts to think, oh, actually, um, I had all my values wrong. You know, I, I backed the wrong things. Um, I backed the wrong causes. Um, does that mean my life has been wasted? I, I, I lived my life by the wrong values, even though for most of my life I thought I, I was living by the right values. That, that was a typical situation I became fascinated in. I wrote at least three or four novels around the, these kinds of ideas. As I, as I got older as a writer, I became interested in that same question, um, but applied to societies and nations. And that's something I'm still trying to figure out, how best to express that question. How, do, how, how would a nation or a country um, struggle with a nation's dark or shameful memories? When is it better to... Um, when is it better to just leave these things buried and, and move on? Because I, we can see all around the world now and, and in history cases where conflict just goes on and on and on. You just can't stop it, stop the cycle because people will not forget atrocities from the past. And sometimes people are, generations are fighting over something that happened centuries ago. And there's a, you know, the hatred has developed. Um, so you want to say sometimes it's not good to remember, but particularly in Europe, I think, and America to Japan, or the, I mean, the, 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 we have problems of memories that have been suppressed and the society is not at peace with itself um, about, say, you know, racism or what happened in the Second World War. Uh, there, there's a sense that Issues have not been addressed. Um, and this leads to all kinds of tensions. As we, at the moment, you know, America is in a terrible turmoil because there's a feeling that certain things about its past, about African Americans particularly, have, have not been addressed properly. Um, I think Europe is, has been in a state of tension through, ever since the Second World War. Um, so this question about personal memory and and national memory, I think, is something that in interests me very much. Mm. 
I, I never really think very much about genre. Um, uh, it, often I'm drawn to a particular project which I've chosen quite carefully because I don't have many ideas. You know, I, I'm not a, I have you know, one good idea every five years or something. So I don't, it's not as though I have a big choice. I, I, don't, I don't sit there thinking, now, now I'll write a, write a thriller or now I'll write a love story or a period thing. Um, I, have a, I have an idea and it's usually an idea that doesn't yet have a setting. It's, I don't really have a time and place geographically or in time, where I'm going to put this story down. I just think, wouldn't it be interesting to write a story about a, a person who has this particular issue and then this happens to them emotionally? It's something quite abstract. And so I find myself almost like, a, you know, the way movie people go location hunting, you know, when they've got a, got a script, you know, where would be a good place to sh film this? I mean, I find myself looking through history or looking through different genres to try and figure out what is the best way to express this story. Um, and so I'm, I'm never particularly, I, I never start off by saying I, I might do something that's a bit like a science fiction book or something, or something like a detective story. I become desperate and I, I use whatever I can to express the particular idea. And it's only when I finish that you know, somebody might look, look at what I've written from the outside and say, well, that looks like a a piece of fantasy, or that looks like science fiction. For me, I, I haven't looked at it from the outside. I'm, I'm like, a, I'm like a, a, a crazy person trying to build a flying machine in my garage or in my back garden, and I'm just putting anything on that will make this thing fly. You know? uh, and uh, uh, you know, I might steal something from next door, I, you know, I'll borrow things, anything that will make this thing go up in the air and fly. And it's only when it's flying that people look at it and say, that. That, look, that, that looks like a, um, you know, a, a, a period love story or something like this. I, I, I never really had a big ambition to be a writer and, until I was in my, almost in my mid-twenties. Um, from the time I was around 15 years old, my, my big ambition was to be a, a songwriter. And I spent a lot of time writing um, songs in my bedroom with a guitar. Um, I, th I think um, I was very much inspired by um, the man who won the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, last year in, two in 2016, Bob Dylan. I remember buying uh, an album of his when I was 13 years old. And I, I still remember the album, it was John Wesley Harding. And I think that was when I first became very excited about the idea that you, you could use words in a very mysterious way and create entire worlds, you know, j just with a few words. And of course, the music and the singing and all these things were very important to me. It's that whole combination, but, but that, the, the excitement about words, I think, and the fact that you could use them in this way, I mean, that, that really happened to me when I first listened to my very first Bob Dylan album. Uh, when I was 13 years old. And then I became interested in all these singer-songwriters who are more at the, what you might call the literary end of, of the 1970s boom. Uh, Leonard Cohen was very important to me, uh, Joni Mitchell. I learned to play all their songs uh, myself. You know, I, I, I knew all their lyrics off by heart. And I, tried, I wrote over 100 songs myself in, in my bedroom, um, and I played them with my friends. And in a way, I feel that was my apprenticeship for becoming a writer of fiction. Somewhere in my 20s, I made a, uh, to me, a, a, a transition that didn't seem like a very big one between writing songs and writing short stories. Uh, it, it was only over a period of about a year when I, I was writing songs at the beginning of this year, towards the end of that year, that energy had gone into writing short stories. And um, after years of getting nowhere uh, professionally as a singer-songwriter, around the age of 24, 20, yeah, when I was 24, 25, as soon as I started to write short stories, they were being accepted and published by magazines. And uh, um, I was actually spotted by the publishing house that is still my publishing house in, uh, in London, Faber and Faber. 
um, a company that's pub published many, many Nobel Prize winners, <laughs> actually. Um, and, um, and I wrote my first novel under a contract with them. Um, so um, it's like many things in life. Um, I was knocking on one door for a long time and then another one opened. And, and from then on, I mean, fiction has been my focus. You know, um, but somewhere at the back of my mind, I'm still, I'm still a, a singer-songwriter. Yes, I, I still write, I, I write song lyrics for the jazz, American jazz singer Stacey Kent. In fact, a, an album of hers came out um, in October, I think, and, and the, uh, two of the tracks um, have my lyrics on. I still, I work as a song lyricist, and it's, it's a, for me it's quite an important part of my, um, my writing life. Um, I, I, it's, it's another kind of outlet, and I, I feel it's quite important for me to, to have that, this other writing life, where I think in a very different kind of way. I'm forced to think in a very different kind of way because I'm collaborating, and I think that that's always a healthy thing to have collaborators. One of the disadvantages of being a, a novelist, as opposed to being um, a, a lot of these scientists work, work in big teams, um, and if you work in the theater or films, you, you work with teams of people. Um, the danger for, for novelists, I think, is that you know, we work in isolation, and so there's a, pro there's a, there's a problem. You, 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 you may not grow and develop in the same way it's, it's easier to become ossified. Um, and so I think it's, for me, it's quite important to collaborate with people in, in other fields like music or film. Um, I find it very stimulating and I learn many things from uh, what, what I'm obliged to do in collaboration. <music> yes, I've, I've spoken about my early influences f from, from the world of uh, music, you know, singer song, songwriter music. Uh, um, uh, but if we're talking about actually literary influences, um, now oddly, uh, you know, people never s seem to say this when they're looking at my work. But I know that the uh, the, the novelist that's influenced me the most is Charlotte Bronte, the 19th century British uh, novelist, uh, and particularly two books, Jane Eyre and Villette. Um, and um, I, I reread um, Jane Eyre and Villette about five years ago, and I was quite embarrassed. It, it was full of things that I, I, I could recognize. I had stolen from those books. But I, I, re I read those books at a particularly crucial point when I, in, in my writing life, I think, before I actually started to write fiction, but uh, when I st was starting to think about writing fiction. And so particularly the use of first person, uh, the first person technique you know what a what the narrator hides from the reader and hides from herself in the Charlotte Bronte books um, became the foundation for me um, and so Charlotte Bronte remains a big influence there are other writers that that are great favorite writers of mine possibly Dostoevsky is my favorite novelist but probably he he hasn't influenced my style very much I mean he writes in a very, very different way. However, I think influence is a very interesting and subtle thing. Um, sometimes somebody who's very different to me in temperament, actually, I think because of that difference, that it, it's almost like it, it's, it's a, it, it creates a tension, a natural tension, and I think that's very good. Something is pulling me away from my comfort zone, and I think, oh yes, I had to do that. You know, what would Dostoevsky do with this? And of course, I could never write like Dostoevsky, but I think a little bit of Dostoevsky would help here. You know, it stops me becoming. And, uh, and Marcel Proust was, was very important to me, um, more technically, you know, how to, how to tell a story not necessarily through the plot or through chronology of how the events unfold in your story. But the great freedom I see in, in Proust's work of, of just following the drifting memories or the thought associations of the narrator. So you can have an episode from, from yesterday and it goes right into a memory from 30 years ago. Um, 
this much more abstract way of ordering your canvas, you know, uh, as a writer. Um, I, I learned an enormous amount from, from Proust. But everybody, you know, Kafka is another, another writer who's very important to me. Uh, Kafka and Samuel Beckett, and actually Harold Pinter, another, uh, I think uh, Kafka isn't, but the other two are Nobel Prize winners. Uh, people who, sh who give me guidance and inspiration about how to deviate from uh, realism, from, from you know, uh, you know, doing something to distort the, uh, the reality, that, that the familiar reality that we see around us. You know, how, how do you distort? Well, once you move away from, from orthodox realism, the question becomes, well, so what do you do? I mean, how do you... What become your what? What are your new laws? You know, by um, uh, if you're if you're an outlaw, you have to you have to you have to. In fact, this is the Bob Dylan line, isn't it? To live outside the law, you have to be honest. Um, but I think that's very true when you deviate from re realism, and um, and so the great writers like you know, Kafka, Beckett, Pinter, they, they are models for me. For, for how you deviate from, from, from conventional realism. Well, I, I've had many people who, who have been important editors and advisors um, uh, in my writing over the years. I mean, many of them are professional uh, people, my editors at the publishing house. Um, so my, my agent, my first agent, Deborah Rogers, who, who's passed away now, and my first editor, Robert McCrum, were very important influences. But the person who is actually, uh, who has a very deep influence on, on what I write, at all kinds of levels, is, is my wife, Lorna. Um, and I think part of it is because, because she is my wife, and uh, she, she, she tends to boss me around in many aspects of my life. And so my, my work is not excluded. However, the, the, the key thing here is that um, we were together, we were a couple at a time uh, you know, before I started to, to write fiction. So somewhere in her mind, she, she doesn't have this, you know, she doesn't think that I, I, I'm this kind of famous author and that she is criticizing the work of a famous author. She still thinks I, I'm this postgraduate student um, who, who's got this crazy idea that he, he, can, he, will, he can write fiction. It, it, she, she's, she's, she still thinks of me like that. Um, and so she looks at it and says, well, what, what is this? You know, uh, that, that has never changed because um, she was there looking at the very first things I wrote uh, in a little room we shared together, you know, when, when we were both postgraduate students. And, and I don't think the relationship has changed very much. And the problem is that once you, you start to become well-known, well-established, and for me, you know, I, I won the Booker Prize in Britain when I was 34 years old. The trouble with that is that, I mean, because there were many great things about becoming respected young, but because a lot of people stop criticising you. They're... they're afraid to criticize you or professional publishers think you'll move to a different publishing house if they, if they, if they speak frankly. Um, so I need somebody like my wife who, who thinks of me as an upstart, you know, who, who, has, who has all these ideas above my station about, about writing. And, um, and she can be quite brutal. You know, I, I've, I've sometimes abandoned whole projects because she, she has taken one glance usually when she's in perhaps not a very good mood and says, no, this won't do, do something else. <laughs> well, a lot, I mean, a lot of people ask me, you know, do you have any advice for, for aspiring writers or young writers? And of course, these days, I don't know how it is in, in Sweden, but, you know, certainly in the English-speaking world, um, Every university seems to have a creative writing course. Um, uh, um, there are private creative writing programs everywhere. Everyone is very keen to, 
to be a writer these days. That wasn't the case when I was, <laughs> when I was young. Uh, nobody was interested in, in literature. Uh, but it's very, it's very difficult for, for me to, to come out with any kind of useful advice about how you write. I mean, everybody must do it in their own way. But, but there is one fundamental thing I would, I would say to, to people at the early stages, or people who have these ambitions. I would say, particularly in the world as it is today, you have to ask yourself, do you really want to write? Or do you want to be a writer? Because I think many people have this ambition to be a writer. You know, they want the status, the position of being a writer. But actually, they may find that they don't particularly want to write. And I think to be a, to be a successful writer, and I, I mean successful not just commercially, but I mean, I mean to be a writer who achieves something worthwhile, regardless of whether it publishes, is published or sold. I mean, you, you have to have a special relationship with writing. Um, and I think part of the difficulty at the moment is that it, it's quite difficult for people to, to find out themselves which it is they really want. Because be, being a writer has become such a coveted um, position now. And, um, um, and, and a lot of people dream of being a writer, but sometimes perhaps that isn't the right thing because you know, writing isn't, isn't for you. you know. And that's all right, you know, something else maybe for you. So I, I would say get that very clear. Try and find out, you know, do you really want to write? That's the important thing.